What up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Nerd Jerry Report. I'm your host, Pablo, and joining me, as always, is Mr. Brian Schultz. Brian, I know we've been away for some time, but, you know, work. <laughs> but I've been very uh, much looking forward to our conversation um, for episode seven and eight, Brian. I'll say this before we move on. Based on the com- the conversations that I've heard and the things that have been said in the past regarding the show and certain episodes, episode eight was one that I mentioned that that I, that I was that it was rumored that it was going to be a bigger gut punch than episode five five, and it wasn't. It wasn't, but it was a great episode nonetheless. Brian, let's start off with episode seven if you don't mind. What did you think of that? side of Rogue that we had never seen before, Brian. It seems that they take the opportunity, Brian, to show us what happens, I guess, when certain mutants or X-Men are in a high state of emotion and what they're capable of doing and, and how well the animation displays their capabilities, Brian. What did you think of that, uh, not introduction of Rogue, but that side of Rogue? You know, it it's a very different type of display, but I did have like a, a whiff of the, what we have here is the rare opportunity for me to cut loose. I, I kept thinking watching it, even though the motivations were completely different from Superman and Justice League Unlimited, that like, was this really the first time we saw Rogue go all out and just let, like, let it, sh- like, let it show? I was trying to think back to the original series. Did we ever see her get that angry and cut loose for that amount of time? I couldn't really think of an episode or sequence where she had done it. She's always powerful because of the mutation that she has, but like this revenge mission, personal vendetta angle was seemed different to me. I liked it. I enjoyed it. Brian, I think comparing this rogue to the rogue that we've seen in the past, rogue has seemed always very careful and playful with her abilities. Knowing what she can do, but not going perhaps uh, to her limits to really cause serious damage, Brian. These are one of those blackout moments. You know what I'm saying? Because uh, they even showed it in her face like she was just enraged. And uh, it was very interesting, especially when we got to Ross. Uh, yeah, we'll get to more to Ross because <laughs> Ross is one of many Easter eggs or MCU parallels that have shown that have popped up in the more recent episodes that I just don't think are accidents, people. I mean, like, you know, he's in there, he's referring to the Hulk, Cap makes an appearance, like Spider-Man makes an appearance. I'm like, not a shadow. <laughs> they didn't have to have those little sequences, but they all add something to the fabric of the episode. And, you know, getting back to Rogue, you, you brought up a good point. I think this series is asking some very interesting questions and taking some of the characters in interesting directions relative to the 90s show. Because you're right, even in the original show, Rogue always felt like she was second billing. I can't, there weren't that many episodes where you're like, hey, here's Rogue spotlighted for 15, 20 minutes of the episode. Well, there was, she had a couple she had of a episodes. Few, but, but I felt like she was yeah, not, yeah. like she, she kind of felt like she was second shelf. I feel like this show consistently is kind of asking those, whoa, what if Scott was really duplicitous, right, and immoral? What if Storm is the one who lost her powers and maybe had to compromise or sort of go through a, a trial to get those back? What if, you know, Rogue was pushed to the limit and literally lost it on screen for 15? Like, I think this show actually is doing a better job in some ways of doing that than the, the original one. And we can get into, yeah, as we get closer to the end of this season, we can start to have that debate which is, first off, hats off to the show that it made it a debate, that we can sit here and have the debate of which one is actually better. But I just enjoyed seeing, like I said, seeing yet another classic character 
doing something a little bit different with purpose. And to your point, the animation, the action, her trail of destruction has a point. It is not wasted, like what she's doing and why she's doing right up until the moment where she's kind of, I guess, sort of pulled back from the brink. She had to be very careful, right? So she was, I guess, playful and not and, and making sure that she wasn't touching things and doing, you know what I'm saying? Because that was traumatic, especially if that 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 Captain Marvel episode where she is she is used to take her power and she leaves. Uh, my, uh, what's her name? Uh, Danvers, right? Because that's the original Captain Marvel in that in that series, right? Uh, in a coma. So that would be interesting to see that in live action. Right? <laughs> I think people will welcome it. You mean welcome, um, welcome the MCU Brie Larson being put in a coma? Yeah. <laughs> And by the way, I think Brie Larson would sign up for that in two seconds. But oh yeah, everybody's trying to get out. You you already saw Michael Douglas. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ross, I wanted to make this comment before we move on to that 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 sequence, Brian. The X Men, we're seeing cameos, Brian, because they don't talk to regular people. Who do they talk to? They talk to the X-Men or the mutant police, the FBI, CIA. They are the they everything to the mutants. So Scott has to be who he is. The X-Men is, I mean, uh, Professor is, you know, always on edge and worrying about Wolverine, where he's going to go, who he's going to connect with. So whomever they meet along their paths, these individuals will most likely be... Uh, a cameo of some sort. So continue, Brian. The Ross. So what does that say when Rogue can get through a barrier that was created for the Hulk with no problem, Brian? That was fantastic. Ross's kind of arrogant response of, ah, we're good. Like <laughs> this thing was built to hold on. <laughs> Two seconds later, his face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh snap that was fantastic i i love by the way i loved steve rogers participation i love I gonna it. talk about right that up right until now. i don't know if the shield toss is one of my favorite things that i see <laughs> <laughs> but that was that was amazing. you go you go oh, you go already tell the memes of what cap is saying like you could you could put whatever in there <laughs> that was like the best playground one of ship of all time. It's like, I will take your toy. You better start running. Go deep. And he gives her that look like <laughs> um, that anime Brian. If there was any animated Captain America I was waiting to see. I was Captain Car uh, Captain Carter was fine and all that, but Captain America live um animation, Brian. This what they sh gave us, I think, was was reminiscence and the, had the essence and aesthetic of the original cap and the cap from the comic books. Brian. I think that was the point. I think the point was to give you one that was more of a throwback one. And whereas you probably say the Chris Evans version is had to be modernized for for live action. This was more like buttoned up cap, like yeah. company man yeah. cap. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at the animation and looking, I want to ask you what your thoughts on this is, and what your th what your thoughts out there in, in, in the comment section below. Let me know what you guys think of this possibility, because DC has done it before and they've done it successfully. And what that is is Brian bringing the comic book adaptation of storylines into uh, animation. Doom. You can go on and on and you and you turn into dark and all that. What are your thoughts, Brian, if they announced an Marvel animation the Infinity Gauntlet, Brian? The way they did it in the card in, in, in the comic. That'd be fantastic. I would love to see that. I, mean, the, I would yeah. love to because see Because the that. movies, 
the movies kept the essence of the story, but edited yes. out enormous yes. parts of the storyline, character participation, some of the cosmic divine elements, and you know all these things that we never got to see. It's a much larger build yeah. to that version of the story, and quite honestly, would be much easier to do as an animated show. Like, it, there's a lot of stuff that could have gone very wrong had they attempted. You know, characters like oh, Death yeah. or, you know, even a more serious oh, yeah. Adam Warlock. We obviously saw the one we got. Like, I just, you know, they made yeah, some good yeah, editing yeah. decisions for what they were trying to tell. But Absolutely. no question. And, like, this has always been the one area where DC has had the leg up. And I think this is the first time in a long oh, the time. the roles are almost This reversing. is the first time in a long time where it's like, oh, like Marvel animations, you know, stepping up to, to give us something true. Kudos to you. Kudos to the crew over at Marvel Animation because you guys over there are getting some great direction and, and you guys are putting out some good stuff. But let's continue with the X-Men uh, Episode 7, Brian. Well, you finally get kind of the reveal, right? The sort of who we, we, we've been following Mr. Sinister, but we finally kind of get the, okay, we pull the curtain back and we find out it's Bastion. So your worst fear is not realize They don't play the apocalypse card. I don't know that Bastion is probably, I don't know where we, where he would be. And he's probably not in most people's top few X-Men villains, right? Which is probably deliberate um, that they went a, someone a little bit notched down and try to make that character interesting. But we finally get that reveal. Like, okay, here's, here's who they're playing against in theory. So what did you think about that reveal? Since you were very concerned about where we were headed with the big bad. I don't think we got his backstory till episode eight. Brian. Correct. We just got, it was almost like a cliffhanger. We just got the cliffhanger yeah. that it was him. But we had saw little beat, I would call him crumbs of his presence in, in a lot of episodes, even since the beginning. He's been around. If you watch all the breakdowns from Merchant. Yeah, who, I forget who said it. Someone said he's, there's actually a reference to him in episode one, if you're like sharp enough to find it. They basically deliver. Oh yeah, he's in a picture. Okay, yeah, they put a trail to be like, With yeah, Forge. okay, yeah. And then in one episode, the episode where they go to the ball and Magneto's going to, they're doing their Saturday Night Fever competition <laughs> then. Um, he walks, uh, Magneto looks up and he walks by and you see like the top of his head and stuff. So you, he's around. Uh, but I was interested, Brian, in his, in, 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 in understanding his reason for him doing what he's doing, Brian. So that I think was further explained in episode eight, because I remember her waking up and and then she's talking to uh, uh, Nightcrawler, and then she starts breaking down. And I think the the Ryan, I think I have to give also kudos to the voice acting here, man. They're doing they're doing a great job in terms of really conveying emotional grief. And that, and I like the scene that she turns back, and and the X Men are right, like right there, and they, it's just I just love the way they put that whole scene together. I think it's interesting that um, Nightcrawler doesn't pop up in the original episode, but I feel like he's gaining importance as the season is moving along. Like I thought he gives a very well written eulogy for Gambit at the start of the episode. He then is sort of the voice of reason. They choose oh, him yes, to be the voice talking. of reason for Rogue at the end. And then in episode eight, which we'll talk about more, maybe my favorite single action shot of the entire season they give to him, which we can talk about wow. later. And I thought it was absolutely genius when they did it. I was like, "Are you? I, how did nobody try this before? And I hope they try that in live action because I think it would look pretty cool if they get the right VFX crew, but... So anyway, all of a sudden he's become like, oh, like he's a major, he's a major player now. I guess the voice of not reason, not logic, but a sense of hope, of understanding. Uh, I don't know. Is he? But he, he, he always. That 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 moment of like you you thinking about whatever it is you're thinking about, he gives it that other side. To finish the rogue point, rogue actually. Yeah. So she breaks down, but then she actually does go over the edge. She gets bailed out by the writing because she lets Trask fall. So oh, yeah. she does actually technically like intent to commit the murder is there, 
but she gets bailed out because of the obviously we don't know the twist and the reveal that's about to happen so he doesn't die yeah, right yeah, and that yeah, winds yeah, up being a that so that's actually how she kind of that's how she kind of gets injured right because he basically reawakens and that form of him you know surprises the them sentinel. yeah and that's kind of yeah, what, yeah, what yeah. yeah so it's weird they kind of actually bring her to the edge twice if that makes sense from an emotional standpoint and then they they all kind of are like horrified although wolverine of course is like she does something we all <laughs> want to do so <laughs> Nightcrawler was like, what have you done? What, what have you done? Would it be interesting to you, Brian, if Professor X has a talk with her at some point to find out what is, because she, you know, she, she you know, she crossed the line, right? If, if Professor X is there, you know, does he stop her? You know, like... <laughs> I don't know, man. The way this show is set it up, Professor X's calendar is going to be so busy. He about to go back to the Shi'ar and be like, "Man, there's too much to there's too much work for me here." Yeah, man. Yeah. Get in line. Yeah. Brian, what did you think of that sequence? The awakening of that the the, the Sentinel Prime Sentinel, Trask yeah. Sentinel, Prime Sentinel. Yeah. Are we getting? Are we kind of transitioning to Episode Eight now? Is that what you're talking about? Or just, or just uh, the no, trash. Thing. That scene, you see Scott stand up. You know what I'm saying? Like, and, and you see, and sometimes Brian, I think his blast is like useless. <laughs> Firing blanks. Is that what you, are you suggesting? You know, it's like, it's like you, like who can you beat really? Unless you know you're trying to save yourself and you could do some dope moves. With, you know, with regular folks. Hey, I need but, a clarification. So I do need a clarification. You might know this better than me. I thought. And I have to go back and watch. I thought Morph was only capable of shape shifting into the appearance of the character. This show makes it seem like he actually becomes the character that he changes into, including the powers. Is that? I've all I've thought I thought about that as well as to how his powers work. If anyone in the comment section can look and let us can let us know how it works, but I think he can take on the character. Ha- that he know that that he that he turns into and have their powers only for a limited amount of time. That's what I think. Okay. Because it would make sense. Like if he can turn into any of these guys and have their powers, he's pretty unstoppable. That's what I'm but saying. If yeah. It, if he can have it for just, probably like ten seconds, I okay. don't know. So he gets, it's like a video game. He gets like one powered up shot with each one. I, <laughs> I just didn't remember in the original one. I feel like in the original one, I remember there are scenes where he would change shape. And then he would be caught. And part of the reason he'd be caught is he couldn't do everything that the actual character could do because he didn't have their mutation. Whereas this show seems to make it seem like, he, yeah, you're right, he temporarily gains all of their abilities, um, which he tries in this scene too, unsuccessfully. But he may not know how to use any of them. Yeah, so I don't, I, it's just, yeah, it's one they haven't explained. And I'm so, kind of like, yeah, I, did yeah. I miss, did I forget, like, you know, what he was given in maybe the later seasons? Cause obviously he, he dies in the original show and then he kind of comes back and like, I, you know, so I don't know if I'm just missing part of the continuity there, but yeah. But yeah, I, I thought that sequence was, was, was dope at the end. Um, well, see, this show too, in that sequence, because of what happened to Gambit in episode five, these sequences become much more intense because you don't a hundred percent know anymore. So like when, when, right, when prime Trask is laying waste to them, you're like, well, they, they, they wouldn't kill another white. Right? That wouldn't happen. And like, it looks like it might until cable arrives, but like, because they've actually done it, even if they were to bring Gambit back magically, because they've done it at least for a while, all of these fights now, you're a little more on guard. Some stakes. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because you never know. It almost felt like watching Castlevania and, and there was this character named Cypher. You, it's like you you almost thought that she was going to bite the bullet in one of these episodes and she was always managed to pull something, pull it out. Episode eight, Brian. How does that, I saw that one a few times as well. But how did that one begin? Uh, episode eight really, f- I feel like, focuses more on on Bastion and sort of the reveal of the Prime Sentinel project, right? Sort of the the, yes, okay. the infiltration, uh, the infiltration of human. We spend a lot of time with him, sort of the, the the chained Magneto, 
you know, Guy Rick. Like we're spending more time with them, I feel like, in the early parts of the episode. And it's really the X-Men who are left to deal with the fallout of that reveal in the second half of the episode, leading to Professor X's, you know, sort of literal <laughs> drop in at the end at the end. So I don't I like what did you think of like the the prime sentinel mutation on a mutation kind of as the big you know, insidious plot that's been going on for a while under everyone's nose. I mean, they hate mutants, so so they they did that's you know this guy's trying each sinister apocalypse. Each of them have their plans for mutants, right? Each of them have Magneto. Every villain has their reasoning for or their big plan for mutants, other than the ones that are just, um, you know, mischievous and, and criminals and all that other stuff. But these bigger foes, they have big plans. And and the biggest enemy is humankind, right? One of their biggest enemy is humankind. And they, they, the X, I wouldn't want to be an X-Men. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, uh, there, I will say there was a moment in the episode where I was thinking this wasn't mayor, a little bit mayor, Hun, a little bit mayor. Just it wasn't my favorite plot device. There was a little bit of like, oh, we're doing the Walking Dead thing now. We're doing the Twenty Eight Days Later thing, and I do I want to do I want to see my heroes fighting a mindless army effectively? I'm like ah, like I don't know if I told, but. Part of me was like, I know this is part one of three, right? This is a three episode arc to end this season. And when they started, I was like, oh, are they going to be battling these dudes for three episodes straight? And the answer is no. And so like that kind of, think, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So then I, by the time I got to the end of the episode, I was like, ah, the real reason you did this was not about Bastion. It was about Magneto. That's what this was yeah. really about. Bringing him to the point. It's amazing how one word can be powerful, right? Enough. Enough. <laughs> and that was cool. And then, you know, now, I mean, I'm, I, Brian, I cannot wait for this next episode because now we're going to see these com- some of these conversations happen with Professor Xavier um, and Scott and the rest of his X-Men. And I like the detail because there's a risk when you do what they did at the end of this episode where people are like, wait a minute, Ma- Magneto can do that? I'm like, yeah, but he went to the poll. The magnetism, man. They, they put the science to allow him to like yeah, amplify his power yeah, to a global scale. Yeah. I'm like, that's yeah. you know, it's a little detail. But it's like, if he just yeah. if he just uncorks that, what a minute he escapes off of Genosha, I'd have been wait, what? Why didn't he just do that yeah. at any point in the last 50 years? But because yeah. okay, he he waited until he was pushed far enough, and then he went to the one place where he could. Harness that kind of power. He probably, yeah, he probably knew he could do it, but there was no, there was never a reason for him to do it. And once again, in this show, as I keep saying, the Cobra Kai thing keeps happening because, you know, even even the X Men afterwards are like, yeah, he kind of saved all, he, he kind of saved all of us, like by doing that, right? So again, Magneto. But I got to get back to the action in this episode because Wolverine and Nightcrawler's fight is one of my favorite sequences, up to and including. The teleportation, and they put us inside Nightcrawler's yeah, tele. That was, I was like, like <laughs> I was like, that's it right there. Because I didn't understand what was happening. Well, Wolverine's like face was changing, and I'm like, oh, they're showing you POV of the of what it's like. Of what it's like, yeah. It was, it was. It, you know what it reminded me though? There was an episode in the original X Men animated series. There was an episode where Wolverine was put through some sort of uh, disorientation with reality that he was literally scared out of his mind. That he did not want to go out. He like was like the Hulk in Infinity War. He didn't want to come out. It was that serious. So it reminded me of that point. If, if you guys know in the comment section below which episode was that, let me know because I remember. It, it, and it was against some fiery looking dude that was like, I don't that was uh, he has some weird powers. My other favorite, my other favorite, like running gag in the X Men is the destruction of the mansion. I'm like, this is like 
this is like the architectural equivalent of like the dudes in red on Star Trek. Like, I just wait. I'm like, when are you going to do it? What are we going to Ah, there it is. It's the delayed waste again. <laughs> like, Professor X should come home oh, and not even man. be surprised. Not even be surprised that the school is rubble. He's like, oh, this again? Yeah. We got to rebuild for the 27th time? <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's funny. I mean, they, they, they did it with the Blackbird. And oh, that was the other thing. They even acknowledged it because yeah. they were like, it's the third Blackbird in how like three months. I was like, they that's that's like some fourth wall like fun they're having right there. I loved it. It was great. Xavier is one thing. He is paid. I wonder how much money he really <laughs> because it's like, come on, man. How many of these Blackbirds you just get like right away and the house is rebuilt, you know? Yeah, because he's not supposed to have like Stark level resources, right? But he kind of like it. Kind of seems like he does. <laughs> yeah, because it's like, how many times are you gonna be rebuilding? And I'm sure he he can't be rebuilding like brick for brick like Batman. <laughs> you know what I'm well, saying? Well, like Cerebro alone has to cost like <laughs> what? What? You never know. He probably brought some new tech with him that makes it even crazier. I was amazed that the tech that Bastion had. Like, what service does he use to be able to see a HD version of this dude being crowned? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And the Shia Emperor holding hands. And like, that was crazy. Yeah, that's like a warp 100 speed signal, right? For that <laughs> distance that has to travel. <laughs> you probably use the three body problem. <laughs> but, um,. You remember the sequence uh, with uh, Scott Summers, Jean Grey, and Cable? What did, what did you think of that sequence of them in the tunnel and stuff you like that? You mean the action sequence? The one leading to them yeah. in like the, the family drive? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I yeah. mean, it probably wasn't my favorite action sequence of the series. It's there to basically be a family moment in a family show. I mean, that's what it's there yeah. for, right? And cross generations and cross time. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, it's fine. Like it, that one yeah, felt more live action than anime hard. to me. You know what I mean? That felt like a scene yeah. you write into a live action yeah, yeah, film yeah, yeah, more so yeah, than yeah, like yeah. into the We could do this live yeah, action. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I don't know. But it was just, I think it was just a bit forced to look. It felt like that scene because it's not like they did anything. Right? No, that's what I'm saying. Like, it's like, they it's just, just like, like, he makes that line about like, what, you know, don't mess with the Summers family. And then it's like, Summers what did they like, achieve? Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that's what I wonder about how I mean Cyclops I mean I know we trying we rooting for you but every once in a while we wondering what can you do um yes the Magneto sequence I love the details the close-ups that they do with these some of these characters she says to him tell me talk to me tell me and they just look at him and he's like that's my opportunity right there. Let me, let me kick my game, yeah. right? Did they ever give us any conversation uh, between her and Magneto before she released? Well, him? you don't, you don't get the, you don't get the piece that gets him released. There is right. There's sort of like implied exchange. Once again, don't have. Yeah, note to note to would be captors of Magneto: do not put female anyone <laughs> within reach of that guy. Let him call him the master Magnus for nothing. <laughs> He's like a cult leader. He's a cult was... leader. That's what it is. Like, they, they give him five seconds with anyone. You know, it's like this guy's preaching the word. <laughs> but Brian, so far we have two more episodes left. Do you think we'll get an apocalypse at the very end of this that will be sort of a cliffhanger for next season? I'm going to say no. Um, I think the show's done a pretty good job of restraint. So I, I'm going to say no. Um, I guess the, the thing I'd put back to you and I'd put out to the audience is, who do you think, besides Professor X, because I think his arrival signifies he will be one of the lead characters we spend time with in episodes 9 and 10, who else do you think is actually going to be the lead character or characters of 9 and 10? I mean, I would presume it's X and Magneto. But this show has really rotated who has got who has been top billing week to week. This is not, hey, 
we're going to feature one or two characters every single week and everyone fill in around that. I feel like this show is really distributing the wealth. And so I don't totally know who else is going to be center stage. I, I feel confident in X and Magneto because that relationship, because of where we left this episode, that they have to hash things out. But there's a lot of directions they can go. And honestly, you know, the most obvious that people would have bet on coming in, Wolverine's kind of been, he's been support. He's been support man all the way through. We haven't really spent a ton of time. If you think about it, we haven't spent a ton of time with him. And that's deliberate. And 100%. I'm waiting for the episode for the next season. Because they already got two seasons of this. Um, whenever they release, they decide to release the second season, we'll probably get a, a deeper dive into where he's at. He's probably going to be kicking it with Storm. I'm telling you, he still hasn't seen Storm. But that's a bold choice, I think, given how we've spent the last 25 years of anything related to the X-Men, certainly in the live action world. You know, it's been always kind of all roads lead back to Wolverine. And this show has almost very consciously made sure that he's in the background. And he gets his action moments. He gets a couple of things. He gets a good line. Grief's a lonely war. He gets some good lines. But he's not the lead of this show by any means. And I think that's a really interesting choice because I don't really know who the lead, like if you say like, who's the number one star of this season through eight episodes, I think you can make a case for like six characters. That would be a good debate. <clears throat> that would be a good conversation. And I think it's a good lesson MVP. for the live action. You don't have to. You don't have to ride Hugh Jackman or the next Hugh Jackman for another 20 years. You don't have to do that. This show proves you don't have to do it. It'll that. be a disservice. It'll be a disservice. I don't want to see if it even points towards that direction where one character is getting more love than than everybody else. They can be favorites, certainly, but each of them have to shine at some point because, again, they're a team. They're family, and they're they're and they're at their best when they're together, and, and we want to see that. So. Uh, yeah, let us know in the comment section below what you guys have thought so far of season, um, episode seven and eight. Uh, two more episodes left. Uh, will Do you think you'll see Apocalypse in any of these episodes or probably a cliffhanger? I think they might. Okay, so you're in yes. I'm in no, but yeah, okay. We still haven't seen Colossus. And we I, haven't I, seen I, any I of see. the bad guys. But check this out. Well, we're going to see Colossus now because who's, a, who's uh, uh, awaken? Omega Red. Yeah, fair. So we might, we might, we might get some. Uh, who knows? Omega Red was, I think, was much more connected with with Wolverine's past, right? So who knows if Cap may be involved? Who knows, right? Who knows? This show has done a fantastic job of giving us surprises in each of uh, these. But that's episodes. what I mean by restraint. Like a lot of the yeah. a lot of the characters who you who might have expected would have been mainline characters, have been more like cameos. Sebastian Shaw, Emma Frost. We haven't you know Sabretooth, Juggernaut. There's a lot of there's a lot on the roster that hasn't popped up. It's in the opening montage, like in the classic show, but they have a lot of things in the bag that they can go to and make it new, make it fresh for season two or even the end of season one. I think that's a testament to the show and an understanding they had that each of these characters can carry large amounts of the narrative to where you don't need 12 characters in an episode to make the episode worthwhile. Yeah, that's on the comment section below. Hit that like and subscribe button, and we'll see you next time on the Nerd Report. The show goes on! Yeah!